In a moment, Gareth Jones on speed. But first, the weather with Mark Webber. Um, hey, oh, oh, hello, mate. We were thinking that the weather might blow a, a bit of a ginseng button in me. It doesn't look like it's going to happen, so the weather here at Williams is going to be calm. Um, oh, can, oh, oh, can you tell where it is yet? Hello and welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed. Coming up in today's show, a little bit of this. And I'll go, thanks very much, that's brilliant. And then I'll poo myself or something, because I'll just have lost the motor function. <laughs> and some of this. No, I was not waving. The first thing happened, I was very... When, when the car started to roll, I was worried about my neck. And plenty of this. <laughs> All that and more in this, the third ever edition of Gareth Jones on Speed. What you're listening to right now is not the sound of an F1 car. This is the sound of an A1 Grand Prix car. They sound about right, don't they? This is the first edition of Gareth Jones on Speed since I became the pit lane reporter for a one Grand Prix. If you saw the inaugural race held at uh, Brands Hatch in the UK, you'll know that 25 countries from around the world are now taking part in something called the World Cup of Motorsport, with plenty of overtaking. Team Brazil's Nelson Piquet Jr. was the winner on the day of both the sprint race and the feature race. But despite this, the former F1 world champion's son still wasn't the luckiest driver there. That honour went to Khalil Bashir, one of the drivers for Team Lebanon, who, in a spectacular crash with Team Italy, rolled his Lola three times before emerging from the cockpit absolutely unscathed. So, later in the show today, I shall be abusing my new position as pit lane reporter for A1GP to bring you an exclusive interview with Khalil Bashir, officially the luckiest man in motorsport. <laughs> Meanwhile, Zog's been doing his own style of pit lane reporting, this time in Brazil. Later, he'll be back to talk about the outcome of that race, but he's already sent ahead an interview with the youngest ever F1 champion. Fernando Alonso, Fernando Alonso, Fernando Alonso, Fernando Alonso, Fernando. Fernando, thanks for making time for Gareth Jones on speed here in Brazil. You're now the youngest F1 driver's champion ever. How are you feeling? It is difficult to put into words how this feels. The realisation began to dawn a few races ago that I might be able to maintain my point advantage over Kimmy. But you can never be sure. I knew that third would be good today, but I wanted to win. Fernando, thank you very much. Joining me in the Gareth Jones On Speed studio, i.e. living room, as usual, uh, a very special guest today. I'm thrilled to say that uh, Richard Porter, the man behind SniffPetrol.com, is here. Richard, welcome to Gareth Jones On Speed. Hello. Um, can you explain for me, you're actually a, a researcher on a very well-known BBC car programme as well, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I'm, can I just be ego-driven for a moment? Are you a producer? I'm, no, no, I'm a script editor. Ah. I was a researcher uh, years ago, so I started in this business, but um, since then I've moved on and um, obviously now I can get other people to go and get me a cup of tea, which is brilliant <laughs> and is the, is the only perk of the job. So yeah, that's what I do. On, on the well-known car programme on BBC Two at 8 o'clock on Sunday's uh, new series starting in November. You can do as many plugs as you like. We I don't know why I did here. that. They, I don't, they owe me rather than me owing them, but anyway. Um, and which came first then, Sniff Petrol or your job on that well-known BBC Two uh, car Well, program? no, I started seven years ago. I was a researcher on, on um, 
for Top Gear, and I did two years of that, and then I left and went and did other things, and uh, started working for a company that went bust, and when you're a journalist and you, you work for a company that goes bust, you're not unemployed, you're freelance, and so whilst I was busy freelancing with my friends Richard and Judy and endless cups of tea, I got a new internet package at home and with some free web space. And I had this vague idea to do a website that was sort of supposed to be like, you know, The Onion, have you seen theonion.com, terrific site, been going for a while, um, US news spoof thing, and it, I just loved that. So I wanted to do something similar for cars, and with the sort of reservation that cars aren't particularly funny generally, and so I've had to recourse to making things up, that's the way that Snip Petrol gets around it. Um, and I couldn't get the, the internet package thing to work and I spoke to this uh, this, this uh, guy I vaguely knew in Northern Ireland who ran an internet company and he really liked the idea and he hosted it for me and which meant it was a lot could be a lot bigger and has now sort of run for god like three or four years now. And how popular is your website now? Um, it, oh god it gets like about 40,000 here unique visitors a month. Wow. It's so Mickey Mouse and I get emails all the time from people going did you know that your website doesn't work in an octopus browser or Badger or one of these other <laughs> sort of really obscure real ale internet browsers that I, I don't use and you know it's only recently I cottoned onto um, Mozilla and um, uh, so I I kind of cobble it together at home and the, the, none of the code works properly and I can't see how many hits I get. I can only see unique visitors and I have no idea. I get the weirdest thing is I get emails from all around the world, though, from uh, a lot of Americans and Australians and things. But then you'll get uh, an email from someone going, "I really like your website," and it'll be signed from Belarus or something like that. And it's that like, fantastic. I mean, the internet is is extraordinary like that. And I'm not really a techno geek, but I get quite freaked out that there are people in Alaska looking at something you've written because it doesn't happen in any other medium to that extent. So it, cool. It's primarily, it, Sniff Petrol is primarily about the motor industry, which yeah. you wouldn't expect to be funny, and yet you no. make it very funny. Well, yeah, it's a bit hit and miss. It's, I think it's, it's funny when it's at its most preposterous because it's taking itself so seriously. You know, the, I, have to, I have a sort of rule that if I've done someone one month, I don't do them again, just because it seems a bit unfair. But every time the German car industry does something, they're so po-faced about it and if you ever, I've been very lucky in my job to occasionally go to these sort of uh, these launches abroad and I seem to have been to a disproportionate number of Audi Volkswagen type ones where they, they'll take you to Germany and they sit you in this conference room and they just show you endless charts of stuff and it'll be now we come to figure 16.8 the ashtray function is 15% improved of the old model and <laughs> A, you've measured this. Yeah, yeah. Get out more. And B, you, you just you're just thinking, does this make the car better? And the answer is clearly no, because and I, I, it's, it's hilarious. And that is where the industry is at its most funny when it doesn't realise that actually in itself it's being quite funny. And uh, so I, I love all that, but um, I do do a little bit of motorsport stuff. And I think again, motorsport takes itself incredibly seriously sometimes, and it's all all quite sort of um, anal engineering and very very intelligent men doing stuff and. And the drivers behave in some quite absurd ways sometimes. But unfortunately, I, I just know a bit more about road cars than I do about motorsport. I, um, I, I know a distressing amount about... You know, there's that idea that, that, that um, I think Conan Doyle said, or, or in Sherlock Holmes, that uh, the mind is finite like an attic. And if yeah. you put one more box in, something will fall out the other side and you'll forget where you left the house keys or your name or, yeah. or how to eat. I have that problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just really worried that one day someone will come up to me and go, you know, Rich, did, did, did you realise that when they designed the Austin Allegro, um, they actually got the panel presses wrong, which created the uh, the bulbous sides for which that car is rightly derived. And, and I'll go, thanks very much, that's brilliant. And then I'll poo myself or something because I'll just have lost the motor function. It's a, it's a constant concern that I'm just accruing information uh, uh, that I don't need. Fernando, did it make your race harder knowing that those 71 laps could win the title for you? For me, there was a long race, but my motivation and concentration was kept going by keeping third from Michael, who was chasing me for the final part of the race. The final laps seemed to take forever. 
and it took a while for it to sink in once I came to a stop. Fernando, gracias. Ole! Well, with, without sounding too nepotistic and vanishing up each other's um, backsides, <laughs> the, the plan is to, in a way, merge what you do in, on Sniff Petrol and Gareth Jones on Speed. You, you're going to be responsible for a strand within this programme that deals with motor industry stuff. That's going to be funny, we hope. Yeah, and maybe some motorsport stuff. But I think that I'll go to write down some... Um some stuff on the back of an envelope in a pub and then we'll come in and I'll do a funny German accent and you can do... Uh, I'd like you to do Flavio Briatore again, actually. Just, hey. just keep writing things. Go, hey. Oh, dear, Rich, not this one. Please, God, no. Now, th- this plan, I should explain, was concocted um, in a, a, a small... I can't call it a cafe, really. It certainly wasn't a restaurant. At Brands Hatch last weekend at the first A1 GP meet. Um, you were down there. I was down there working. Did you enjoy the race? Yes, yes, I did. I've decided I enjoyed. I was. I have to admit, the sprint race. I was expecting more overtaking, and yep. I think possibly people at the front of the pack were holding station because they didn't want to be a hero, and end up sticking it off into the gravel and then having to start from the back. But the main race, the feature race, yeah, I just if, if only for PK's manoeuvre around the outside, uh, which was unbelievable. I, I I've seen a man bend the law of laws of physics. That was I, I was what staggered. He, yeah. And we were standing sort of round from uh, Clearway, so you could see across to Surtees, wasn't he? Did that move? Yeah, that's right. You could see it, and it was I've never been so excited at a motor race live there. Was, I had a pair of headphones on. And I was listening to the producer in my capacity as a pit lane reporter. I I didn't hear. Was there an audience? A crowd reaction? Did people roar? Uh, yeah. Well, actually, it was a funny one. It was. It wasn't a roar. It was a kind of. Ooh, and then there was a ripple of applause, I think. I would uh-huh. have wished that we were near some Brazilians, and we weren't. The only, a lot of British people, um, and uh, there were there were some Dutch people further down, which was brilliant. Yes, Josh de Bosch is going by, and they're up in the stands as well. Did you see them up in the stands? So I heard those the above my smoke. headphones, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable, and Next that's right. what... And I'd like to think that, you know, without it being sort of jingoistic, that that is the way it's going to go. That yeah. It's national fervour, but it seemed all very friendly. You know, yeah. there was no... Well, the reason I think for this is, if you go to a football match, it's usually your nation versus one other nation. So it's, it's head-on, it's direct confrontation. I'm better than you, and I don't think that's a good thing. Whereas in motorsport, you've got my nation against the rest of the world so everyone is a minority yeah. every crowd member is a minority and so you, you know you behave better and I think it's a good way to behave in the world but also I think when you're because when when, <clears throat> um, uh, when Robbie Kerr went out and uh, we were all disappointed but immediately I'd already got in my mind who else I was ro- rooting for exactly I had yeah. a pecking order of sort of and because Yoss you know I quite like and the, you know it was always easy to follow the orange car as well which made it uh, interesting but also he had, a, he had a few good runs and that Italian guy whose name I can't remember Enrico already, Tocicello yeah I can't remember or pronounce as well <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's, uh, he was terrific I mean putting on a show as well in a way that you just don't seem to get in F1 you know really hanging it out on, on, on clearways rather and uh, it was and great and is A1 GP here very briefly is it here to save motorsport do you know, I'd like to think it is. A safe, uh, open-wheel, uh, high-speed motorsport. Yeah, definitely. And say, and also remind the world that slick tyres are a good thing. For God's yeah. sake, get rid of the grooves. It's just... And to see that Italian guy, uh, Fettuccini, well, sorry, I can't say it. I don't remember <laughs> what his name is. Uh, so I'll just be stereotypical, sorry. Um, but uh, he was just getting it a little bit out, uh, uh, coming out of the bends, and just and he thought so, you know, it, the, because the car is set up differently, and it's not all about downforce and dirty air, and it's but a decent set of slicks, and the track was bone dry, and he was just hanging out, and you can see the car slide. And when do you see that in F1? I don't, you know, I've been to Grand Prix, and you just don't unless someone's going to have a crash. Really, it's just such a they move so so little. Um, I know I'm biased, but I really. Do do believe in A1 Grand Prix. I think it is going to be massive if it isn't already. I hope it is. I really hope it is because I'd like to think, if nothing else, it'll give Formula One a kick up the bottom that it really needs. So, yeah, yeah, all hail uh, A1. I think, it's, I think it's a good thing. I hope it gets um, even better. Something I forgot to mention at the start here, full respect to uh, A1 GP, I've scored a really cool Lola 
Heritage Cap, which has been signed by two A1 Grand Prix drivers, uh, Basil Shaban and uh, Khalil Bashir. I have to pronounce his name very carefully. There. No, there's a lot of phlegm there. That was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we're going to give this away. There's a prize. You can have this. Uh, but not, not you, Richard, but people listening oh, to oh, the show. Do you know what I like about that? There's two things. First of all, it's uh, the, the cap is black with uh, gold sort of logo on it. bit... Uh, Lotus JPS kind of era, which is cool. Yes, um, fact, inherently that's cool. cool. Yeah. Secondly, um, Khalil has signed it in Arabic, and yeah. you don't get. Everyone needs an Arabic autograph in their life. You don't get that if you approach Tom Cruise. That's terrific. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's un- a really nice bit of of, um, of gear. Of gear. Yeah, yeah. A, a unique prize, as they say on the radio, um, <laughs> and we'll give that away uh, if you can answer a, a certain type of uh, question a little bit later here on Gareth Jones on Speed. Richard, great to have you with us. Fernando Alonso, Fernando Alonso, Fernando Alonso, Fernando Alonso, Fernando Alonso. Senor Alonso, the McLarens were your main competition today. Did you expect them to outpace you? I kept pace with Montoya in the opening stages, but after the pit stops, when Kimi got ahead, I realised I couldn't win. We didn't have the speed off the milk allowance. Fernando, thank you very much indeed. Hola! We're giving away a fantastic competition prize on Gareth Jones on Speed today. It's a Lola Heritage racing cap, which has been signed by the two A1 Grand Prix drivers of Team Lebanon. Now, it was one of those drivers, Khalil Bashir, who was cruising along in position seven at the race at Brands Hatch when he crashed out spectacularly uh, when he was nudged by the Italian car. The car rolled three times, but luckily Khalil was able to climb out of the car unharmed. Now, afterwards, the two Lebanese drivers were invited to the Lola factory to see how the A1 Grand Prix cars are made and to be presented with the roll hoop that saved Khalil's life. Um, While they were there, uh, Khalil also was introduced to the man who made the roll hoop. And, of course, Gareth Jones on speed tagged along to record this momentous moment. Gary, how did you do? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Glad you made it. You saved my life. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, good. Hell of a roll, was it? Yeah, (laughs) not bad. I've seen a little clip of you sort of hiding your face and a little bit frightened, was it? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So exciting racing then, was it? Yeah, up to that point. Yeah, Yeah. no, it's very nice. Yeah, Yeah. it started very, very well the A1. Well, at least it worked, didn't it? At least it saved your life. Yeah. Are you the only person making roll hoops here? It seems that way, yeah. I did a lot of the ones at the beginning. The first, I think, 10, 12, 15, something like that. How many hours it took everyone? Um, this one's, I think, about 28, 29 hours to do this one. Really? Okay. Maybe that's why it saved your life. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all done by hand? Yeah, all done by hand. Yeah. And what's your name? My name's Jeff. Jeff what? Maskell. Jeff Maskell, I'll never forget this name. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a sense of your responsibility when, when you're putting parts together like this? Well, yeah. I mean, if I make a mistake, I do something wrong, then someone's going to be knocking on my door asking me what I did. If I miss something out and it finds out there's something I've done, then it's my mistake, isn't it? So if, if he died and it was my mistake, then I wouldn't have been too happy about that, would I? Well, we know your work is good now, don't we? It's tested and proven <laughs> yeah, in the field. It's testimonial for me, isn't it? So if I'm looking for a job somewhere else, I'll be all right, won't I? <laughs> Afterwards, I asked Khalil what he's going to do with that roll hoop now he's been presented with it. Well, <laughs> first of all, I want to keep it with me. It's, you know, it's really something that saved my life, and I will keep it in my room. Presumably... You don't go into motor racing to win these kind of trophies. I know, I, it was a little bit funny. <laughs> they are giving me this. It's not a trophy. I need the cup, not this. But no, anyway, it's it's uh, it's kind from their part, and I will keep it as a souvenir. I hope I will have a lot of trophies, not roofs <laughs> anymore. Basil, I bet you're glad it wasn't you in that car. Even though I would have liked to be the one racing that race. Um, you know, no driver wants to be put at risk, but we do know that what we do is dangerous. Because we love to do it, we uh, we soldier on and and we uh, we love the sport and it's part of it. So we just move on, keep racing. Do you know who's going to drive in the next race? 
No, we don't. Team Lebanon works in a way where the team decides who's going to race for the weekend at the end of Friday practice. So we'll know end of Friday who's going to drive. They told us that they're going to fix your car and that'll be the same chassis that you'll be driving next time around. How do you feel about that? I feel, to be honest, I'm not scared at all. I feel, I, I would like to drive the same chassis and hey, chassis, did you, do you remember me? You kicked me out, this time I will win with you. <laughs> so this is what I will say to this chassis. Basil, you have an understanding of, of, of technology. I, I noticed that the questions that you were asking were, were quite sophisticated. Do, do, you feel, do you feel better knowing so much about the technology in, in A1? You know, like most single-seater drivers, I aspire to be a Formula One driver, and that's the most technical level of the sport. And the more you can know about the technical side, the more you can actually help influence the design of the car and have a better conversation with your engineers and, and hopefully help develop the car better than the competition. So that's also one of my, one of my goals in, in that respect, is having a technical prowess. Khalil, I've got to ask you, what was going through your mind during that incident if you look at the onboard cameras you were waving your hands around what, what was going on no i was not waving the first thing happened i was very when when the car started to roll i was worried about my neck so uh, i don't know what happened i did my i was I, I don't remember i remember well what what was happening but i don't remember what i thought at that moment that happens let's forget it and look forward to be on podium not to have trophies like this one now here yeah. they, they said that uh, the car came back here full of gravel and that it's now yeah. that gravel is on somebody's driveway uh, at the front. <laughs> um, uh, any long-lasting effects from the crash? How do you feel physically? No, no, not at all. The second day, I had some pain in my shoulder. I visited a doctor. We had, I had, this, I am, I have a small injury, but I should be ready for the next race. I'll be racing and doing hopefully good results. <laughs> Fernando Alonso, youngest ever Formula One drivers' champion. You had some pretty tough opposition this year, didn't you? I beat Kimi Raikkonen. I beat Juan Pablo Montoya. I even beat Michael Schumacher, and he's rubbish. The fact I, I've taken over the title from Michael Schumacher is a bonus. I'm quicker than Michael, and I'm much, much younger than him. I bet he has a tape of on his bike and his mum sent him to bed at 7 o'clock. Thanks for making time for Gareth Jones on Speed here in Brazil. You're listening to Gareth Jones on Speed and uh, with me in the living room today, uh, Richard Porter from Sniff Patchell. I'm very pleased to say... Arriba! Sog's back with us. Hey, Sog, welcome back. Hey, good to be here. How was, how was Brazil? It was fantastic. I've been bathing in cachaça and uh, <laughs> sambering with Pele, and it's been fantastic. Yeah, a lot of fun. Um, uh, while uh, we're on the subject of Brazil, I suppose we should mention this small motor race which happened there uh, last weekend. It was a race. Uh, what do you think, Sog? Oh, fantastic. Uh, the only uh, fly in the ointment was that Montoya's magnificent victory was, was overshadowed by... Uh, that, uh, the other big news of the race, Alonso, world champion, fantastic to uh, to see such a, a wonderful driver uh, and a great talent um, breaking Michael Schumacher's run. I think all of us in this room here, Richard, Zog and I, we're all Juan Pablo Montoya fans. Richard, how do you feel about Alonso winning the championship, but um, Juan Pablo Montoya winning the race and stealing some of his glory? Um, I, actually, I, I was a Montoya fan. I, I sort of I wavered a bit uh, this season because I think he's... He's made a few little mistakes and things, and I'm, I've not been so impressed with his his. What form. little mistakes? What like signing for McLaren? Yeah, well, that was a, yes. <laughs> he just yeah. didn't. The Who pen control there that? was extremely poor. <laughs> he failed to control the pen at the right moment. He should have just written Mickey Mouse and run off laughing, <laughs> and and everything would have been fine. But uh, no, he had to sign his name. Uh, but no, I do. When he's on his on his day, I do still like him because you know he does that. He'll go for it, and he's a he's a racer. But um, what I think is odd, if I was Alonso, I you know, for completeness, you'd want to win the race that made you world champion. What, like Damon Hill did? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ha ha. 
<laughs> Damon Hill fan in the house. I mean, I mean, having having been a little bit uh, mean to Alonso a moment ago, I thought. I mean, I I I, I loved seeing that the moment when he stopped the car. And you know he got up, he got out, and he was he was kind of looking down. He, you know you don't know what's going through his head, but he was completely in his own world and just concentrating. And and then when he he let go with with that emotion, and he was leaping up on the car, fabulous. I mean, it was a wonderful, wonderful moment. I loved that. I thought that was it was really nice. It's always nice to see uh, a professional focused sportsman just basically go mental and start just releasing all these things that presumably have just been pen, you know pent up throughout the season as he's had to get on with the job and then it all just flows out. I met uh, Alonso once um, a couple of years ago in in Monaco and because people do say oh he's very focused for his age he's very focused. Um, you say focused, I'd say grumpy. He was really, <laughs> really grumpy. And so it's I was le- less an old head on young shoulders, just a grumpy just a old grumpy man. old man. Yeah. Exactly. It was. It was the thing. Um, him and Truly were, were, were uh, teammates at Renault at that point, and and Truly was excellent. I still got a lot of respect for Truly, even though he does seem to get a bit bored during race. Ah, oh, I've got to go I around mean, again and again, and he just slows down. But but I. I like Truly because he was a nice guy and he he was a good fun interview. But a lot of does like a girl. Does he? I've he never does noticed. run like a girl. If you if you look back, I yeah, should have challenged him from three or four years ago. He clearly runs like a girl. Ah, yeah. but can I just say, in terms of running like a girl, uh, Villeneuve last uh, oh god was it end of last year or the year last season. When his car caught fire and he ran away from it like a girl. Yeah. Still, I, well, uh, interestingly, fair, fair because point. Truly ran like a girl when his car caught fire, when oh, he was I in a, a Prost or a Ligier, I think it was a Prost. I don't remember that. Oh, he ran like a girl. Oh, his arms out. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. But we yeah. do love him. And I he's do, cool. Yeah, Truly's yeah. great. But this is the thing. So I was talking to Truly. He was cool. He was funny. Uh, Alonso was uh, a bit grumpy or focused, depending on, you know, take your pick. But, um, uh, it, I, I said to him at one point, it was at Monaco, and I said, you know, when, when, you, when you're going down here, it's so narrow, and it's incredibly narrow, and you actually go there, you know, and you realise the hills are much steeper than they look on TV, the, the tunnel is much narrower than it ever looks on TV, and I said, is it like when you're trying to get a normal, you're on the road, and you're going down a narrow street, and you think you're going to knock your door mirror, and you kind of go, and suck yourself in as you're driving down, I said, do you do that at Monaco? And he looked at me grumpily slash focusedly and said, no. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> okay, guys, um, you got about three seconds each on this, right? But the, the question is: now that Alonso has won the world championship, do you care about the remaining F1 races, Zog? Yeah, I want McLaren to go out there and kick ass two more one-two finishes. Richard, sorry, I just fallen asleep there. I, I was probably thinking <laughs> about the next race. <laughs> Do you know what I don't? I wish I did. Um, uh, but uh, this season, and I think history will look back on this season as a, as a really good F1 season. But I don't know America and uh, a few other things, uh, including me just finding better things to do. I, my, my relationship with F1 this year, and I don't know why, has become like this sort of strange loveless marriage where mm. I kind of go through the motions every other Sunday and then uh, I feel sad. And it's an addiction, I think, yeah. rather than a dependency. It's an addiction. I think. I think, I, I, yeah. I think you need counselling. I think I, well, for a number of things, and uh, that's why I'm not around to watch the races on Sunday. My therapist is free. Uh, well, I'm, actually, I think F1 counselling is something that we should deal with uh, on yes. Gareth Jones on you speed. phone in or something. I think yeah. So, yeah, in an yeah. upcoming... We, we pro- do this. Done. We'll do that. In the meantime, uh, here's another snatch from uh, Zog's interview with the world's youngest F1 champion. Fernando Alonso, Formula One world champion, what does winning this title mean to you? I like being world champion. Mum says I can stay at late now. So, if you had to do the same again, would you, my friend, Fernando? Michael Schumacher is a poo-poo. It's a big smelly poo. <laughs> Gareth Jones, Huntsman. Gareth Jones, Huntsman. In a moment here on Gareth Jones on Speed, uh, your chance to win a fantastic prize, um, a Lola racing hat, which has been signed by two A1 GP drivers. But first, 
by way of showing full respect to Richard Porter from Sniff Petrol, who writes spoof and comedy news stories on his website, we thought we'd play a a version of a TV programme. There's a, a TV programme in the UK called Have I Got News For You? So we present Gareth Jones' On Speed's version, which is called Have I Got Old Car News For You? Hello and welcome to Have I Got Old Car News For You? I'm Angus Deaton and I'm going to say something very clever. That was it. <laughs> um, right, OK, the first one, uh, which is going... Know, thank you. Uh, Violet's brought in the, the a press. A fraction of the car magazines that are cluttering up our hall. A <laughs> fraction of them. May they crush your lap. I know, just put them down on the floor, gently. Right. Oh. Right. <laughs> OK, this one from, uh, from Autocar in the 1980s, right? MG Rover sold to blank. Richard? BAE. Is the correct answer. MG Rover sold to BAE. Um, uh, can I have an extra point for pointing out they weren't called MG Rover then either? They, they, were, they called... were called Rover Group. Well, actually, no, they were called Austin Rover. That's true. And they were... were bought by BAE and they became Rover Group. And I'll get my anorak now and leave. <laughs> <laughs> we love your anorak. Okay, right, okay. And this one from Autocar in the 1990s. MG Rover Group sold to. <laughs> Zog? Uh, BMW. Is the correct answer. And what were they called, MG Rover Group, then, actually? Uh, no, I they were. So. Uh, 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 no, what was it, Richard? Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 I'm embarrassed to admit, they were called uh, Rover Group, and uh, they were then <laughs> just part of BMW, and they became MG Rover when they were uh, disposed of by BMW in uh, 2000. Fact. In the 90s. Sorry. OK, so what percentage was owned by BAE and what percentage was owned by Honda, if I remember right? Uh, there was a share swap agreement which came... They took 20%, 20% of each other, didn't they? Yes. That, if you I, don't get points because you're the quiz master. Yeah, but I didn't realise I knew that until nah, I looked at you. you see, Listen, is, we can world. barely fit into this room for the amount of motorsport <laughs> trivia that is in here with us. Uh, OK, uh, this one from Autocar at the uh, at the turn of the century. MG Rover Group sold to... Richard? Uh, the uh, well, Phoenix Venture Holdings. <laughs> Actually, no. 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 For an extra point. Phoenix yes. Group? I believe they were technically sold to a group called Tektronic 2000. No! Which was was uh, the four uh, men known as the Phoenix Four in their terrible Birmingham businessmen's grey suits. You know that thing that Birmingham businessmen do where they tie their ties so they sort of hang down below their testicles? <laughs> and I was worried about the company when it fell into their hands. I thought, you know, if you can't even go down to next and get a new suit, then why should you be running a huge company? But that, that I believe, is the case. Uh... OK, if this one from Autocar in 2005. MG Rover Group sold to... <laughs> Richard again. I'm so sorry. Uh, they were sold to uh, Nanjing Automotive uh, of China. However, the uh, intellectual property rights to some of their models were sold to um, uh, Shang- Shanghai, Shanghai, Shanghai Automotive, Automotive uh, I Group. I can't remember what the bits stand for. SAIC. But, uh, SAIC. Automotive. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, and so it's still ongoing. Um, as we speak. Have they actually Ooh. got anything that they can build, though, without getting into real big legal problems? Because ba- basically, uh, mm. they bought the rights to a bunch of cars which Honda owned the rights to. And a bunch of engines, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, uh, I, I heard a story when it was all uh, going down uh, at Longbridge that uh, Honda engineers had been spotted there, and a rumour went round, oh, maybe Honda are going to make a bid, and maybe they want MG, because it would be a nice little fit for them to have this British sports car maker. And the truth of it came out that the Honda engineers were there just to get their stuff back. Uh, I think they'd left some CDs. You know, it's like when you break up with a girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Oh, I just want my stuff back. You've got my copy of Trivial Pursuit and that, that Lenny Kravitz CD. OK, and finally, uh, this one from Autocar in the year 2007. <laughs> right, yeah. From uh, the future. MG Rover Group sold to... <laughs> Richard? Me. Because I've got a fiver in my pocket, so... 
that's all it'll be worth yeah. by then. Because, well, that's yeah, only half. I was robbed. That's I... five times more than what Alchemy paid for, or, or the Phoenix. Well, the Phoenix group, paid that? a tenner for it, but that's two pound fifty each, which is a bargain. So, I feel we're not needed on this program I think anymore. That we're outclassed. No competition. No, no, no contest. No, 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 no. Of course you're needed. We're needed. Okay, what's it? Violet, Violet, what? You are needed because it's time to play oh. Card Next Year. Hey, oh. This is a game that we usually play in the car on the way back from uh, from some you know from some motor race or other. Um, it's a way of passing the time and. We pick out a couple of cars at random on the road, usually, you know, the next two cars that pass on the other carriageway, and we've got to think of a connection between them. Simple as that. OK, so, uh, as you know, uh, we can't come up with the cars ourselves, because that means we could be prepared with the answer. So, the world's greatest girlfriend, Violet Berlin, is with us in the... Uh, uh, Violet, lean I'm in and tell us. I'm the girlfriend of one of these men. So <laughs> why they're all applauding me. Hang on, I was brought here under false pretenses. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll cut that out. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, yes, car connections. What I'm going to do is I've got three random cars, and every week I come up with these random cars in different ways. And this week, I got a three-year-old to pick the cars randomly. Oh. I went into a shop and uh, got some Matchbox cars. So, Ooh, so you okay. did the scale models. These aren't quite scale models. They're toys, but they're based on real cars. And I've bought a selection of these cars, and uh, I'm going to get uh, Zog and Gareth to put their hands into the bag and pick a car. So you can actually might be able to feel what kind of a car, you know, whether it's... Uh, mm. a, a convertible. A, a, yeah, whether, something yeah, like that. It might give you a clue. And okay. then all three of you are up against each other to work out the connection between the two cars. OK. Um, but I must say that uh, the listeners have to listen very carefully on this because that hat that you're giving away as a competition prize... If anyone could come up with a connection where you can't, or a different connection, uh, the best connection sent in by email will win the hat. OK, okay. we'll give so the email good. address and remind you how the competition works in a minute. But first, let's play Connections. OK, so Zogger first. You're the... Uh, the Zog's hand goes okay. in the bag. Expert of today. I'm rummaging now. Um, I feel, OK, I'm going, I'm going for this one. What Here do you think go. it's going to be? What do you think it's going to be? Uh, OK, I think it's some kind of 4 by 4 uh, am I allowed to look now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking at the. Co- it's oh, it's it, a Hummer. Yeah. Um, now which one? Fact, is it an H two? I think that's an H two. An yeah. H two. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. It's okay. a model of a, a Matchbox model of a okay. Hummer. Gareth. It's an H two. Don't forget, these cars were picked out by a three-year-old no, from a huge selection. These were his favourite cars in the there's shop. There's two in here, and I'm going to pick the smaller of the two. Oh, it's going to be tricky. What on earth is this? It's. Um, oh, I know, I know. That's the the Opal. Um, that's the convertible version of the Tigra. It was the Tigra concept car, wasn't it? That's sort of a, a pickup. It's it's a very weird model, but yeah, yeah I yeah. think it is what's now known as the as the new Vauxhall Tigra. Yeah, it had a different. Have a look underneath. See what it says. Oh, it had a different yeah, name as a concept cheap. car. Uh, uh, yes, it is the Opal Frogster, which was the a Frogster. spin-off of that, a sort of oh. slightly off-roadery version. I've, I've got quite a weak connection between them, which is that I wouldn't be seen dead driving either. Ah, <laughs> very good. I think How can you say that about that little green froggy car? The Frogster. Uh, I, th- I think if I think if the folks out there could see it. They, they, they would be. I think we'll publish a picture of these two cars on we'll the website, to, yeah, actually. Yeah, That's yeah, probably not about any. Um, are there any other connections between these two cars? The H2 mm. and the Frogster, the... Uh, OK, I reckon they're both concept cars from about three years ago, four years uh, ago. Possibly. I think anything named after something in... Named after something in... I've got it! Hitchhikers. I've got it! I've got it! I've got, I've got one. The Tigra is a European General Motors... Um, car, yep. right? And the Hummer or the H2, this particular version here, is actually built on a General Motors already existing 4x4 chassis. And what's the middle size GM 4x4? Let me think. It's going to be the, uh, uh, the... the GMC... The Blazer, Chevy Blazer. The Chevy Blazer. The Chevy Blazer. So they're both GM. That's a little bit obvious, that, isn't it, right? Well, no, no, I was going to say something that was utter rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, say it. Well, I was thinking about Bob Lutz, who is the uh, chairman GM of GM. He's the, uh, now what is he officially? He has some crazy, oh. so you know, GM loved 
president titles. for life. Yeah, emperor. So, <laughs> overlord. Emperor. No, they always. Everyone in GM is like the sort of vice deputy executive senior president of something. And I think Bob Lutz is product development or something like that. He would have signed off the H2, but then in a former life, I think he was uh, at Opel as well. So that's a very tenuous link. I've got it. They're probably both rubbish off road. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The Hummer, I thought it was supposed to be. Well, it, it, oh, it looks like a, a Hummer, tractor, really, but it actually, but... The, the H2 is the smaller version of the Hummer, and it's it's it's, it's about as useful off road as a De Chevaux would be in an A1GP race, i.e., not very. Yeah. So if you've got a better suggestion as a way of connecting the Hummer H2 and the Opel, or if you like, Vauxhall Frogster. Then uh, write to the usual address, which is... On speed at garethjones.tv. And uh, if you're the person who comes up with uh, a, a reasonable or even more entertaining connection, it doesn't have to be accurate than the one we came up with, you can win this uh, cool Lola hat. So once again, the address is... On speed at garethjones.tv. And I bet you do better than we did. <laughs> Well, that's it for this show. You've been listening to Gareth Jones on Speed. I'm Gareth Jones. I'm Zog. I was Richard Porter. And who are you going to be next week? Uh, I'm thinking of being Stephanie Powers. Uh, oh, that'll make a change. Yeah. 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 Well, we we'll look forward to Perfect. you being Stephanie Powers. And uh, Zog, any plans on who you're going to be next week? Uh, next week, I'm going to be Miller Jovovich. Uh, nice idea. Violet Berlin. Can I have... be Zog next week? <laughs> you be Zog, and I'll be Violet Berlin. Actually, the possibilities, if you're going to be, if you're going to be me and I'm going to be Miller Jovovich, I don't want to think where that could yeah. <laughs> That's it for Gareth Jones on Speed. Um, it, full respect to Khalil Bashir, who survived a tremendous crash uh, in the A1GP race in Brands Hatch this week. And so we're going to play out on the Lebanese National Anthem with additional vocals performed by Basil Shaban and Khalil Bashir, the two A1GP drivers. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. ملء عين الزمن سيفنا والقلم سهلنا والجبل منبت للرجال قولنا والعمل في سبيل الكمال كلنا للوطن للعلا للعلم كلنا للوطن Guys, thank you very much indeed. Absolutely fantastic.